Verse number one, moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and pa all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples. Everybody say examples. Yes. To the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition, say for my admonition. my admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you but such, but such as is common to man. Everybody, let's go back and start with verse 13. Let's quote this together. There hath no temptation taken you, but as such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will make with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Amen. I'd like to talk to you for just a few minutes this morning about parasites. Parasites. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. I ask you, God, that you would touch this word to our hearts. God, I pray that if there's any of these parasites lurking in our heart, that today before we leave the blood of Jesus Christ, the illumination upon the word, the understanding and the revelation that you'll give to us, God, that we will in this altar allow you to remove parasites that are draining the strength and the life and the vitality out of us. And I ask you, Lord, here today to glorify your name and, and God to confirm your word with signs following. And I give you the glory in advance because I know I know that you are going to speak to this church with clarity and God with a sound word. And I give you the praise in advance. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And the church said amen. You may be seated. Praise God. There is this word parasite that we are going to make an analogy with because it is a it is an organism that we can kind of understand readily as I begin to look into parasites uh, I begin to uh, understand that there's some things in life that suck the life out of you without you even knowing that it's there in biology a parasite is a non-mutual relationship between species where one species, which is the parasite, benefits at the expense of the other, which is the host. Amen. The, a parasite benefits from its host. A parasite takes life from. It takes its nutriment from. It lives from the, and at the expense of a host. There are over a thousand different types of parasites, so we're not going to focus in on but a few of them here this morning. But there are two different styles or two different types of parasites that, um, that, have, that have been classified. One is an endoparasite, and the other is an ectoparasite. 
parasite. One lives inside of your body. One lives off of your body or the body of an animal. Amen. And there are 700 different types or 700 plus known parasites that affect the inside of our body. And there are about 300 different kinds of parasites that live on the outside of your body. And uh, I'm sure if I begin naming that you're going to, under, you're, you'll readily recognize several of them. Because lice, fleas, mites, bed bugs, ticks are parasites. They're, they're the ones that live on the outside. And they live off of your body. They live off of the blood that they can get off of your body or the... Uh, dead foliage and the dead skin that 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 it, it they live off of your body and uh, they may not readily suck the life out of you but if you've ever had to deal with an infestation of fleas or an infestation of lice or an infestation of bed bugs you'll you'll know that it, it is a problem that causes grief and it's a problem that you don't want to have and when you have the other style of parasites, those that are inside of your body, they include tapeworms and, and all different kinds of worms. And they include viruses and bacteria. And, and these attack you from the inside. And the one common denominator is, is that we are the host. We are what these organisms live off of and begin to pull the vitality and the life out of our very physical in existence and being. I, I have known a man who had a tapeworm and when they took it out, it was 22 foot long. Oh my goodness, how hideous that would be just even thinking about something like that living inside of your body. But the thing about it was is that Ed was rail thin until they diagnosed him and they did the surgery and pulled this thing out of his out of his body. And then afterwards he was in much better health. He put on weight because this thing was literally pulling and and, and the, the food that he ate was sustaining not just himself but something that wasn't supposed to be there that was inside of his body was living off of his very life's blood. And parasites spiritually do the same thing. Amen. A person who is a Christian has the, has the potential and has, uh, has the opportunity to host in their life something that God never intended for you to have inside of your life. Amen. There are things that if you allow them to live inside of you will suck the very spiritual life out of you. Amen. You'll go along for a little while and it won't be as noticeable up front. But as that thing grows inside of you, amen, just as God made everything in Genesis chapter 1 to grow, to mature, and to come to a place of reproducing itself in this world these organisms begin to take over on the inside they begin to reproduce themselves down in the heart of a Christian until they get larger than the capacity your spiritual relationship has to sustain you and at that point in time the balance is tipped and your life begins to ebb in the spirit amen these things begin to suck the life and the vitality out of your prayer life amen they begin to make you miss church and turn away to things that you wouldn't have done before amen because they have to have something to feed off of and they feed off of stealing from you the very spiritual resource that keeps you alive. Amen. You need to be aware of these parasites. Amen. And we read in this, in this discourse here that Paul was giving an analogy of how the Israelites came out of Egypt. They came out of the land of bondage. They came out of slavery. And God brought them out. If you're, if you're following your bread chart, amen, we're right on time. 
because we're, we're right in the middle of the book of Exodus chapter number 20. Amen. And we've just came through the Red Sea and we've just came to the place where they went to Elam and the wells and the, and the palm trees were there. And now if you were following the bread chart, you're at the Ten Commandments this morning. Amen. Putting a, putting a pl uh, plug in for the bread chart. Amen. And here they came to the place that they're wandering to Mount Sinai and said they all did eat the same spiritual meat and they all drank the same spiritual drink. They were together in the wilderness. There wasn't any different separation. They were all together and they all drank the same thing. They drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. That was Christ. Amen. There wasn't... 12 different bands that God went and sent 12 different leaders to bring out of the land of Egypt. He brought them up together. And he goes and said, but with many of them, verse 5, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. You know, there comes a point in time where you got to make a choice. Are you going to please God or are you going to please yourself? Amen. God proved them. The scripture says throughout the book of Exodus that God was proving Israel to see whether or not they loved the Lord their God. Amen. And there is in life a test that God is bringing each and every one of us to. Amen. There are things that he allows to come into your life. Amen. Because he is proving you to see whether or not you love the Lord your God. Amen. And these things were our examples, verse 6 says, to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. What did they lust for? They lusted for the flesh pots of Egypt. They lusted after the food supply that they'd left behind. They lusted after leeks and onions, which grew either in their gardens in Egypt or grew naturally in the hillsides. I don't know which it was, but one thing I do know is that when they got to the wilderness and they got out of the, the land of bondage and they came into the, the, the wandering before they got to Mount Sinai, all of a sudden there was a homesickness for leeks and onions. And I've looked throughout the scripture, Brother Tatman. I've looked throughout the scriptures and I've studied it, Bishop. I can't find any place in the scripture that says leeks and onions were forbidden for them to eat. But what it was is that their heart lusted for the things that was back in the land of bondage. Amen. They began to lust after things that God did not want them to have at that specific moment in time. Amen. So I find a biblical definition of what lust is. Amen. Lust is more than just coveting this or that. Lust is wanting what God does not want for you to have at that moment in time. Amen. There are some things that are perfectly, uh, that there's nothing wrong for in the scriptures. And I've found that in, at, at certain points in my relationship with God, God said, you are not to have that. Amen. That's why there's not a Mercedes Benz parked out there in the, in the parking lot with Tibbs 1 on the license plate. Amen. God doesn't want me to have it. I'm not going to lust after it. I'm not going to go try to buy it. Amen. Couldn't afford one anyhow. Throw that out there. Amen. There's certain things that God doesn't want us to have at certain points in time in our relationship with God. And when we begin to put those things above our relationship with God, amen, that's when he said you're lusting after evil things. Amen. He said, neither be ye idolaters as some of them were. As is it written, the people sat down to drink and uh, eat and drink and rose up to play. I mean, this is speaking about num uh, ex excuse me, Numbers chapter number 25 and 26. The daughter of the priest of Midian caused Israel to begin to eat at a festival to idols. Here they have seen the Lord their God part the Red Sea. 
They have seen Egypt severed from the children of Israel and eight plagues came down and, and it affected the Egyptians, but they, the Israelites were kept from the effect of lice and frogs, the effect of darkness and murrain and the plague and pestilence. God caused that same thing to rain right over there and it stopped and it didn't touch their houses, didn't touch their homes. And when they'd seen the power of God roll the Red Sea back, they'd seen and they were experiencing still that pillar of cloud by day. Amen. That supernatural presence of God, the pillar of cloud by night or pillar of fire by night. They saw the glory of God and yet they still sat down at a pagan idol worship service. Amen. And God caused some of them to be judged. And it says uh, that they displeased God. Verse 8, it says, Neither let us commit fornication and as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. The end result of that time at the, at the altar to the idol was that 23,000 folks committed a fornication in the temple of an idol. How can you say that could happen to the people of God? Here they were just a short period of time, less than two years away from being back in Egypt, having a whip across their back, seeing the power of God roll the Red Sea back, seeing the Egyptian army destroyed, seeing the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of, uh, of fire by night, seeing God miraculously rain manna and quail upon them day after day after day. How could they sit there and commit fornication? in the temple of an idol. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempt also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Came a point in time where they got tired of having bread and manna. Every day is the same thing. You know, I kind of like variety. You eat something the same every single day you're going to start wanting something different but these folks they didn't just say well I wish God would give us a little bit different menu here they started railing against their pastor they started saying, Moses, you brought us out here into the wilderness to die. There weren't enough graves in Egypt, so you brought us out here. And God, he can't do anything but give us manna and quail. Amen. They began looking and they were began uh, railing against God and the man of God. And the next thing you know, God said, all right, if you're not happy with that, let's see how you deal with fiery serpents. Numbers 21, 21, they were out there gathering wood, and if they got too far away from the camp, those fiery serpents would bite them. They were falling over and falling over, and Moses saw that the, the, these things are going to consume Israel, and they began to pray and cry out to God and say, what are you going to do? And God told Moses, raise up a brazen serpent. Cast, a, uh, cast brass into a mold and make a brazen serpent. Put it up over top of the tabernacle. Amen. Let it be an insignia. Let it be a flag. Let it be a banner. Amen. Made out of brass. That when the children of Israel are, looking, are, are out and they're about doing their business and they're bit by these fiery serpents, if they'll just look to where the house of God is. If they'll just turn their attention back to God. If they'll just look to where the altar is. If they'll just just look where the presence of God was dwelling at. Amen. Then they would be healed. Amen. I pray that God turns some of our attention back to where the altar is. Back to where the presence of God is. Back to the house of God. And the place where his presence dwells. 
Amen. Get our attention off of all these other things. I know that we can sit back and we can say that we don't do a whole lot of other things other than the house of God, but the scripture wants us to understand this is the most important place in our life. Amen. The scripture doesn't tell us we can't go anywhere else. Amen. David said in the Psalms, he said, uh, Psalm 37 and 4, delight thyself also in the Lord. Amen. He didn't tell us we could we, that we were just chained to a life of no fun and coming to church uh, so many times a week and that's all we could do. I'm preaching this on Super Bowl Sunday. Amen. My favorite of all time cartoons, The Far Side. I don't know if it's still in papers anymore. I'm giving up my age. There's two... Uh, aliens that fell down out of a spaceship and the news crews there the cameras are there and they got a microphone interviewing one of them he said take us to the Super Bowl which all the world worshipeth <laughs> amen I like football praise God I just don't like the Eagles or the Patriots Verse 10, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, there's no way I'm going to finish all of this up. I'm going to be teaching on some deliverance from these parasites probably on the next two Wednesday nights. But I want to tell you something. There's a symptom that starts whenever you start murmuring against the things of God. Amen. If it's in your heart, Jesus said, out of the heart are the issues of life. And if you can start murmuring about having to go to prayer meetings all the time, having to go to the house of God and do this or that, and oh, we had midwinter and oh, I'm just so tired after everything's happened. And you start murmuring against the things that are, that are good and for your spiritual health. You've got a problem. Amen. And I'll give you another revelation. You just revealed that you've got a problem. When you start talking about bad against the things of God, amen, and the pastor's pushing the bread chart so bad, and, and you're telling me that you don't love the Word of God. Amen. And we sit back and we want to judge sins according to how bad they are. This here tells me it's just as bad to murmur as it is to commit fornication. It's just as bad to murmur as it is to, to, to be in the wilderness there and, and, and complain about the provision of God. It's just as bad as, as doing all of the idolatrous acts that they did. God doesn't look at it big sin, little sin. God looks at it as you've got a problem and you need to get it out of your life. Amen. These things were deeply ingrained in the children of Israel. They just didn't pop up in the wilderness because the opportunity had it and, and the devil was there pushing the right buttons. These things lived inside of their hearts. These things were parasites that were finally making itself known. Amen. And these are things that we need to understand. We've got to keep our hearts pure, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep thine heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Amen. My dad used to infuriate me. Saturday morning, 6.30 in the morning from springtime through the middle of summer. Everybody else got to watch cartoons. Dad said, get up, we're going to work in the garden. Landon Holly, you think I'm, uh, I'm mean? 6.30 in the morning, the last thing you want to do is get up and pull weeds. We had this half acre garden there in the backyard and, and, and it just amazed me because every single Saturday there was a brand new crop of weeds. You'd pull them out on one Saturday and by the next Saturday they were back with a vengeance. And if it rained, you had to be careful because what you were pulling up, you need to make sure that it was a weed and not something that you were going to eat later on. 
oh man, you get upset with your directions of your parents. But you got to understand your heart is the same way. You got to keep your heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. If you slack off one day, things begin to grow that shouldn't be there. You slack off a couple of days and things begin to sprout and make themselves known. You slack off a week, amen, and it begins to choke out the good, the righteous, the holy that God has placed inside of your heart. You can't let up. There is no discharge in this war. And you think that you can sit back and just slide into eternity. I want to tell you something. The scripture says if you can't keep up with the footman, you're not going to keep up with the horseman. Amen. If you can't keep up with the church of the living God, right now it's going to fall. It's going to come so swiftly. Amen. The coming of the Lord is going to happen so fast. It's going to pass you by. You got to live for God every single day. He went on to tell them. Now these things all happened unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. God use this first half of chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians to tell us that we've got to watch what we're doing with our heart. That we've got to make sure that we don't allow a parasite to grow inside of our life. That we can't let something that wasn't intended to be there grow to the place that it causes us to do things contrary to the will of God. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth Take heed lest he fall. Paul must have seen something in the Corinthian church. He must have seen a little bit of pride. He must have seen a little bit of, of pompousness about these people that, that were seeking after the good things, after the spiritual gifts, and after the understandings of God and wanted to be used in all of those spiritual things. But Paul rebuked him in chapter 3 and said, Ye are yet carnal he was writing to him saying you can't sit back and say that you're standing upright and you're fighting this warfare if you've got a fight with parasites going on below the surface what are the three parasites here that I want to bring out this morning three of them are addictions to chemicals to substances I want to tell you something. In today's world, it doesn't take any time at all to get addicted to stuff. We had a brother in our church in Maryland where we just came from that he had a back surgery and the doctors prescribed to him something called OxyContin. That is the most addictive painkiller that they can give you. Amen. It's part morphine and part of other stuff that you shouldn't have, two pills. Two pills can make you hooked on Oxycontin. This brother got hooked on it. And the next thing you know, he's out of the church. He's dealing drugs to make enough money to get the drugs. Amen. There are things like that you got to watch out for. You got to make sure you don't get hooked on the stuff. Alcohol. Amen. There's a powerful pull and tug for alcohol. I want to stop here and go back. Exodus chapter 20, the first commandment. I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen. It also goes on to say that I am a jealous God. And I will visit the iniquity of the fathers to the children to the third and the fourth generation. But I will show mercy unto thousands of them who love my name. You need to be careful about what you're doing in your life, parents. Because God said right there, book, chapter, verse, Exodus 20, verses 1 through 5, that he will visit the iniquity that you get involved with upon your children to the third and the fourth generation. What do I mean by that? My mother smoked cigarettes 
it fell upon me and I smoked a pack a day of cigarettes. My father was an alcoholic. Amen. At 16, I was a teenage alcoholic. God visited those sins upon that the fathers had to the children's. That does not necessarily mean that if you do something wrong that your kids are going to do it. But that thing is going to visit your kids. Why in God's name would you want to get involved with pornography, amen, if you've got a young child? Why in God's name would you want to get involved in alcohol or drugs if you've got young children? Amen. I'll tell you something. You, you're bringing something into their life that they'll have to fight off, and they don't have the maturity and the understanding to fight it off themselves. Amen. Chemical substances, alcohol, drugs, very, very addictive. I'll talk about what addiction do, does to people on Wednesday night. But suffice it to say that addictions are hard to overcome without some other power. There are some folks, they have the willpower. They have the will to dedicate, to keep themselves from getting back involved. I know some folks that threw away the pack of cigarettes. And buddy, they had a trial of temptation. Every time they got around it for months and months afterwards, they felt the pull and the tug. Amen. It wasn't a clean separation, but it was willpower and suffering that got them through. There are others that came to God and gave it up in an, in an instant at an altar. Amen. And God just didn't take the substance away from them. He reached down into their soul. He reached down into their spirit and he pulled the want to out. Praise God. That's what we call deliverance. Amen. And I believe in a delivering God. I have experienced deliverance from myself. Praise God. The second parasite is gambling. We live in a world that is given to gambling. Amen. And I'm not just talking about the Powerball and the lottery. I won't do it, but I, I would ask you, how many people in here have ever bought a Powerball ticket? Amen. Don't, wanna, uh, don't raise any hands. I don't want to know. <laughs> Amen. I've made jokes at times in the past. I said, man, I'm praying for six numbers when finances got bad. Amen. But I want to tell you something. There's something addictive about gambling. It is a tapeworm that when it gets inside of your soul, it's a parasite that begins sucking the life out of you. How, can it, how does it do it? I'll tell you how it does it. It gives you the illusion that you're going to be a winner and that you're going to have it all one day. Amen. And that illusion gets in your mind and you don't mind throwing down money. First a dollar here, then a dollar there, and then it's five dollars, and then it's ten dollars, and the next thing you know, it's an entire paycheck. I know I've seen it happen. I've seen men who went down to the horse track and wasted every penny that they got in their paycheck. Amen. And their wife and their kids had to eat, eat bread and milk for, uh, for, for weeks because they gambled away everything that they had. And, and, and it was always going to come back. Amen. I'm, uh, my day's coming. Amen. I'm going to get lucky one day. And the next thing you know, the house is being f uh, foreclosed on. The car is being repossessed. Amen. Things don't happen. Amen. The way you see them in all of those glittery commercials. Amen. It's not always as good as what Madison Avenue would have you believe. Amen. The end result of somebody who's having a good time and a good weekend having Bud Light isn't the fact that they're sitting on the beach somewhere with the toes in their sand. I mean, they don't show you the families that are broken up because of an alcoholic. They don't show you cirrhosis of the liver, amen, and cancer that comes along with it. They don't show you the, the hell and the heartache of beating children and wives. They don't show you that result. Parasites. 
gambling's an addiction. And whether or not you choose to understand this or not, or believe what I have to say, if you put a 49 cent stamp on an envelope to try to win that publisher's clearing house million dollars, you're gambling away, it's just 49 cents at a time. Hey, ooh, that one didn't go over well. Amen. It doesn't matter if it's 49 cents, one dollar, a dollar 49, ten dollars, twenty dollars, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars. Amen. You walk into Hollywood Casino down in Galloway and you lay money on the table, you are, be, you are going down a pathway that's going to cause you to have a parasitic sucking of the life of your spirit out of you. Amen. It's time to understand what you're doing to yourself. I saved it for last, but sexual immorality is one of the biggest parasites in our world today. There is no shame left in this generation. I was looking at a book that Brother Greg Schultz lo loaned me a couple of weeks ago about the great flood of 1913 in my hometown Dayton, Ohio. And they had a picture of the employees of the, inter of the National Cash Register there. And it brought up remembrance when I was working in downtown Atlanta at Piedmont Hospital. They had pictures of the nursing college classes from 1907, 1908, 1909, 1910. Those ladies were all dressed in clothes that went all the way to their ankles. They went all the way to their wrists. They went all the way up and tied around their neck. The only skin you saw were their hands and their face. Amen. Would to God that this generation understood that the, the lust of the eye is one of the biggest boons that a man has. Amen. Men are prone. Men are wired different than you ladies. Amen. And you might not think anything about it. Amen. And I apologize for doing this in front of the church on, on a Sunday morning and our young people are here, but I think they're mature enough to handle this. What a guy sees goes straight to his head and it shorts out. And all he can think about at that moment in time are things that he shouldn't be thinking about. Amen. Summertime, I hate it for one reason. It's because you can't go anywhere without seeing stuff you shouldn't see. Ladies, when you go out of the house, don't cause a man to sin. And I'm not saying it's all his fault or all her fault. Amen. But what I'm saying is there are things that guys have to fight. Amen. When you go out of the house, dress modestly and godly. Don't give him a reason to take that second and third look. I heard it said one time this way, the first look isn't sin, it's the second one that is. I, I just pray I never have to take, never provoked, I'm strong enough in my spirit never to take that second look. Amen. Fornication is something that is rampant in our world. They say one generation's excess is the next generation's norm. We're in the third generation from the sexual revolution. And what the hippies did in the 50s and 60s, the children of the 70s and 80s multiplied it. And the millennials are going crazy with it. No understanding of guilt or shame and they've got to the place now where the scripture talks about your conscience being seared. You can't tell them that it's wrong. Amen. It takes a supernatural act to turn people around. What's happened? These parasites have lodged inside of the hearts of people around this city, this state, this world. Amen. And these parasites are taking the very life, the very energy, the very spiritual vitality out of this generation. Amen. And our kids are living in this generation. And I hate to say and quote statistics because I cannot, I cannot prove this by my own research. But in the year 2000, when they had the, uh, the march 
the Promise Keepers March on Washington, D.C. They took an impromptu poll there amongst uh, about a thousand of the 500,000 plus men who were there. And in 2000, 67 percent of the men who came there as godly men, men from different churches, different denominations, who came there to make a promise to serve God, to be a man and lead their household, 67 percent, two out of every three had a problem with sexual immorality or pornography. At that point in time, only 35% of America had the internet in their home on a regular basis. Today, it's 97% of America has the internet available either as a phone service or on a cell phone. Amen. And I would guarantee you that that number would be a whole lot closer to 95% today of godly men who have at one time or another been exposed to pornography either by their choice or by accident through the internet on their phone or their home computer. Amen. And it doesn't take long for that tapeworm to begin to grow and dig in. It doesn't take long for that parasite to begin to work in somebody's life. And I'll tell you what, this is the worst of the three, amen, because it will get inside of your life and it will suck away the relationships you have. It will turn you against your friends, amen. It will take you away and make you a loner. You'll no longer value human one-on-one -on -one connections because you can get all of your satisfaction sitting in an anonymous place and it will sap the spiritual vitality out of your life. Amen. I'm going to begin to close. Verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you but such as common to man. Every man, every woman has to fight these same temptations. None of us are exempt. None of us get away from the test. But God is faithful. Everybody say, God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. God's given us the power if we will submit. God's given us the ability to get beyond anything that our flesh or the devil can put in our path. God's given us the ability, if we trust in him, to find deliverance from all of these parasites. Amen. I, I didn't do this as good as I wanted to do it. But I want to tell you as we're closing here today, that there are things that try to sap and take away your spiritual vitality. Amen. And if I didn't name it, it doesn't mean that it's not a concern. Amen. If I didn't put a specific tag on it and, and, and you didn't hear God, you didn't hear God's word today say specifically about your issue and your problem, that does not exempt you from fighting against these parasites. Amen. That just means that you need to find a place of deliverance. Amen. With all the others who have fallen into some of these temptations, that you need to find today a power in the Holy Ghost. Amen. A will to get beyond and get past. A will to tap into that river of living water that will keep you sustained. Amen. Brother Baker read in the adult Sunday school class today. John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39. It's that river of life, amen, that we need to have. It's that flow of the Holy Ghost, amen. We need to have it as a church, but you need to have it as an individual.
Amen. You need to tap into that river of living water on Monday when you're not around the church. On Thursday, amen, when you're not around the house of God. You need to tap into that every single day because when you tap into that, it causes the parasites to stay away from your life. Amen. Parasites benefit at the expense of the host. Parasites live off of our spiritual relationship with God. When they know you've got a prayer life, you're going to find that there's all kinds of things try to attach themselves to you. When you've got a relationship with God in the Word and in prayer, you're going to find there are things that you're going to say, where did that come from? Because those parasites are looking for a home. Amen. The danger is even opening the door. Because by definition, a parasite's mission is to reproduce so rapidly that it destroys you. The thief cometh not but to steal your spiritual vitality, to kill your spiritual life, and to destroy the integrity that you had before they came. I want to quote the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Satan cometh and he findeth no place in me. I want to have a relationship with God so close. The door's closed. Parasites are not coming in. Amen. Every single part of my spiritual relationship feeds the spiritual man and not a parasite. Amen. Every part of this relationship with God strengthens myself so that I can in turn strengthen you, strengthen my family, strengthen the household of faith. Amen. I'm so tired of seeing friends, and I'm speaking about in general from Atlanta to Maryland to, to people I've known since I've received the Holy Ghost. Friends who got involved in something that brought a parasite into their life. Amen. And then they lost the power of their relationship. As Paul spoke to Timothy, that they would deny the power thereof from such turn away. Amen. They'd start doing things in secret. Amen. And quit doing the things in secret that they used to do. You see, they used to pray and experience the power of God. They used to fast and read the word of the Lord and see God work in their life. And then they found these secret parasites that sucked the life out of them. Amen. And now today you couldn't tell them from a rank sinner because they lost the power of their godliness. Oh, my God. What I feel in my spirit today, I pray that right now somebody has seen that the Holy Ghost has spoke to your heart, that the light of revelation has come down and ministered to you as a person. Amen. And as we be all stand here in this building today, I'm asking you, amen, that if God has spoken to your heart here in this service, amen, that you come to this altar right now, that you begin to reach out and ask God. God to get that thing out of your life. Amen. To give you a resolve never to return back to the way of darkness and allow the spirit of light allow the spirit of light to touch your heart. Amen. I close with this. Isaiah 59. There's something called a cockatrice. A cockatrice is a type of a viper. It's an adder that would oftentimes in the desert. Aggressive but passive. It would come from behind. 
It'll latch on to the heels of camels and horses. Many, many beasts of burden were killed by the cockatrice. In Isaiah 59, right after Isaiah 58 about God's chosen fast, reminded the children of Israel they needed to get rid of all the eggs. You get rid of the cockatrice not by killing the snake. You get rid of the cockatrice by killing the lair that has the eggs for the snake. Your mind can be a very dark place. Jesus said it this way, the heart is deceitful. Excuse me, Ezekiel. The heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? There's only one way to make sure your heart is cleaned up. And that's for the light of God. You got to throw the door open. Say, God, search me. Try me. Know me. Look on the inside, God. You know what I can't even see. I, I might be seared in that location. I may not be able to see or understand. So here's the door, God. It's open wide. Search me. Turn your spotlight on. Find all those eggs. Cut off all those sins by righteousness. Let your blood clean me up. Amen. Lord, I preached my heart to these people today. I preached what you told me that I needed to preach. This is divine commandment. And I pray that the light of revelation turns on right now. That every one of us opens the door to our soul. God, if we are walking with you and there's no need of repentance, I pray that you make us sensitive to somebody next to us. God, and some of our, uh, some of our church membership that may have gotten involved with a parasite. I pray that the spirit of love and power and of a sound mind return to our people. I rebuke with all authority the spirit of darkness that has tried to steal away the righteousness of God in our lives. I pray that there is a changing spirit, God, that causes us to hunger for you, that causes us to hunger and thirst after your righteousness, that causes us to hunger and thirst for the kingdom of God. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, God, draw your people here today. Amen. Would you come? Would you make a commitment today to not just come to the light, but stay in the light? Praise God. Praise God. Ministry, if you are through praying with your soul, come and pray with one of these who have come today. Amen. Let's pray the parasites out of our lives.